my pleasure to welcome you today to this seminar on um, the university branding initiative and our communication efforts. You're going to hear from a great panel of folks today, and a lot of folks are uncomfortable with the word branding, and I prefer to think of this as how we tell our story. So there are a lot of tools available to us to do that. The Office of Public and Government or Public and Government Affairs um, have many of the resources on campus that you already use and should continue to use. So we're here to tell you about the ways that our units can help you and to hear from you what aspects of social media and communication strategies are working for you. So this is really a chance to hear from a talented group of individuals and to explore what we're doing with communications. I'm going to let Susan Thielen introduce the panel and appreciate all of you being here. So exciting and invigorating that chocolate. So today we have uh, representatives from dance, education, business, law, political science, international affairs, AAA, student life, journalism. We have folks from all over campus that are very interested in the subject of U of O branding, how to take it uh, from a historical standpoint, how it became this new vehicle that we're working on and how to actually put it in action. Um, before I move forward, I have two more things I forgot. We are offering also Rose Bowl pens free of charge. We ended up with a few extra, so they're on the back table as well. So pick up your Rose Bowl pens. And lastly, our next seminar will be April 6th. And that will uh, be a seminar on social media, which will include blogging, Twitter, Facebook, how to incorporate all the aspects of social media into one communications plan. We are, American Brand Management is bringing in Kelly Matthews to do a presentation from 10 to 3 p.m. In this room, we need to register online. It's $99, which includes lunch. And if you sign up through this sign-up sheet, I'll make sure I send you out information on how to sign up. There'll probably be room between 25 and 50 folks, but for $99, we really feel it's, a, it's an excellent way to take that beginning Facebook knowledge we talked about and mixing it in with the blogging and the Twitter and pick, picking whatever you like. <laughs> um, so that's the details. So first person I'd like to introduce is Phil Weiler. He's the Director of Communications. He'll talk to us about how our U of O branding or reputation enhancement initiative started. Colin Miller is the Director of Design and Editing Services. He'll then talk about how at U of O, the myriad of services available to folks, how you can utilize them and make that come alive. And then we're going to talk to Mike Cole, who we have done some work with as an institution to work on some institutional ads that we have profiled here that really take the actual information given to us and brought them into uh, flourishing for some print ads. So I'll start with Phil. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. Well, let me actually let me start by uh, talking about this question about brand versus uh, other names we're using. Uh, for some people, brand they associate the, the concept of brand with soap. We're going to sell soap. We're going to sell detergent, and that's a brand. It's a Procter and Gamble was big into branding. 
Uh, and, and universities traditionally don't do branding, but one thing that we do talk a lot about in, uh, in the academic environment is this concept of what our reputation is. And so we're looking at this as, you know, we could refer to it as branding, but we could also refer to it as reputation enhancement. University of Oregon has a great reputation, but how do we continue to, to build on that reputation? How do we grow that reputation? And make sure that our colleagues uh, across the United States and around the world understand of all the great work that's done here at the University of Oregon. So we started this effort a couple years ago, actually. And uh, the goal was, was I, I look at it as sort of an onion. We had, the outer goal is we want to make sure people knew about the University of Oregon. They'd heard about us. Uh, then we want them to remember who we are. The next layer is we want them to prefer us. So whether they're thinking about sending a student here or if they're thinking about making a gift and they're not sure where they want to make their gift, we hope that they would prefer to make the gift or send their student to the University of Oregon. That leads us to being supported and then finally advocated. As far as I'm, whoops. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, being advocated for is probably the strongest kind of support that you can see for an institution. That means people are willing to testify at the legislature, write letters in our favor, uh, attend events that we put on, and, and do more than simply have good feelings about us, but actually put those good feelings into action. All right, I'm going to go full so much for our pointer. Let me try getting this going again. All right, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right, back in the saddle. So let me talk a little bit about, um, these are the steps we kind of took uh, to get us to where we are today. First thing we did when we started this effort is we wanted to talk on campus and, and talk amongst ourselves about who do we think we were? Who are we today? Where do we want to be tomorrow? Uh, what are our aspirations for the University of Oregon? So we spent a long time. We ended up figuring we were going to do probably uh, we were thinking maybe eight to ten focus groups with folks across campus. We figured that would really get us a good flavor of, of what the university thought about itself and, and had us help come to some, some consensus. But we ended up doing, uh, I think it was close to 24 focus groups over the course of about a year. So a lot of work was done internally, talking amongst ourselves, hearing from faculty members, hearing from staff members, hearing from students. We spoke with alumni. We spoke with folks from the foundation. We talked with high school counselors. What, did they, what were their perceptions of the University of Oregon? Took all this information, you know, all this, all this uh, data we pulled together through focus groups, and put together an online survey to test to make sure what we heard really was true. Once we had that, we felt like we have a pretty good sense of what the university community thinks about its reputation, what direction the university wants the community thinks that we should be going in. So we took that information and we put out a request for proposals because we knew that this was important work and we wanted to be able to get the, the help of some experts on this. And so we did an RFP process, a request for proposals. We actually hired a firm called Fleischmann Hillard. Fleischmann Hillard is, 
a international communications company. They have offices in 80 countries around the world. Uh, as it turns out, their chief marketing officer, the person responsible for marketing worldwide, is a, is a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. So uh, we were very lucky to be able to have Rich Jernstead, who's also a former trustee for the university, to really spearhead this effort on, on behalf of Fleischman Hillard. And uh, he gave us a fantastic deal. And uh, so we've got the, the best minds, I think, in the world really helping us figure out how we take the University of Oregon to the next level as far as its brand or its, or its reputation uh, goes. So we did this RFP. Once we did the RFP, then we said, well, OK, there's still more work we need to do around research. I'm a big fan of research. Uh, this is the kind of work where you can kind of do it by the seat of your pants. And you can say, well, it, you know, it seems good, and it makes sense to me. But, other people will say, yeah, but that doesn't work for me. And I, you know, I don't necessarily agree with it. And for that reason, I think it's really critical to make sure that you have good, solid research and that everything you do is founded in research. So we did pretty extensive uh, qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, again, looking, in this case, at prospective students and new students. That was, where our, that was the one place where we hadn't spent as much time internally. So we did a lot of work around that. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And then after we put together the research, we're able to build messages and themes for the university. Then we put together a series of communications tools. One of those tools, actually two of those tools, we'll go into some depth today. So this is the research process we went through with Fleischmann Hiller. Uh, again, similar to the first round, we took a look at the existing research, then we conducted a number of in-person focus groups with current students. Uh, we looked at students who had just come to the university and students who had been here for a long time. We had a mix of uh, uh, areas of study, a mix of genders, a mix of in-state versus out-of-state, and including some international students. So we had a really broad cross-section of students. We also held meetings with academic leadership. Again, just like our first round of research, we thought, well, we'll probably do you know, maybe eight or 10 in-depth interviews with the academic leaders. And I think we ended up with 23 of those because every time we did an interview, someone said, you've got to talk to so-and-so. And so another person was, was interviewed. And these interviews were actually conducted by someone from Fleischmann Hillard. It wasn't a university employee who did this work. They were confidential interviews. And uh, they were 30 minutes or longer. And it was really an opportunity for academic leadership to be very brutally honest about what works, what doesn't work, where does the university need to be going, where are we missing the boat, and where are we being successful. The last thing we did is we reviewed our competitors, and that was really, really interesting. We'll go into detail about that. Uh, we wanted to see, well, first of all, we said, who are our competitors? Well, for this particular exercise, we looked at the 15 schools that students were most likely to apply to if they also applied to the University of Oregon. So who are we physically competing against for those prospective students. So we took all this information and distilled it down into a series of messages, a promise about who the University of Oregon is and what your experience will be if you come here, um, what the messages were, what are the themes. And then we wanted to test those, because again, we had a pretty broad cross-section for the focus groups, but it was, at the end, a very limited sample. So we actually then did another web-based survey to test the promises, test the messages, test the themes, we wanted to test those with students. We wanted to test those with graduates, with alumni, with donors, with faculty, and with staff. So we feel very confident that the research that we have is, is very solid and gives us a very strong platform to move forward with. So as I mentioned, we had two groups for the focus groups. We had two groups of freshmen. These were conducted in November of 2008. Um, so it was they had been on campus for about six weeks. So it was actually, the timing was really interesting because these were people who had expectations. They had this vision of what college life was going to be like. Uh, and they had been here for a short enough time that that, that that image hadn't been cracked too much yet. So you know, they talked about, they didn't talk about really what about their physical experiences were, but more about what they expect their experiences are going to be like. So we heard from those two groups of freshmen. I was really intrigued to see if the other groups would hold those same kinds of beliefs, or you know, would, their, would their feelings and thoughts and experiences be different after they've been here for a while? So the second group were sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Again, in-state and out-of-state, variety of majors, uh, cross-section of genders, 
Um, so these focus groups were really interesting. If we had more time, I'd go into more detail, but I have to say time and time again, we heard the same kinds of stories from people. Um, to answer the question about were there a big difference between freshmen and sophomores, juniors and seniors, there really wasn't. Uh, people have uh, a, an idea of what the University of Oregon is going to be like for them, and by and large, that experience holds true for them. So what that means to me is that already I think the university is doing a pretty good job of communicating what kind of an experience you're going to have when you come here. And most importantly, we make good on that promise. Because if there's an expectation, you don't deliver on that expectation, you don't deliver on that promise, that's when you end up seeing people leaving and going to other places because you haven't met their, you know, met their hopes. So this is a very abbreviated version of this presentation because we have a lot of people to go through. But one slide I did want to include was um, in these focus groups, we use what's called a laddering exercise where we would ask somebody like, you know, why would you come to the University of Oregon? And they would, they would give it a reason. And we'd say, well, okay, but why is that important to you? And they'd say, well, it's important because of this. Well, why is that important? And you would continue to try and, and force people to answer the question why because eventually you get to really what sort of the core essence is what really drives them, what is really, really important to them. And typically, when you ask these questions, you get these, you get these attributes, sort of these surface kinds of answers. And then you ask the question again, and they talk about what the benefit is. And then finally, you get to this core belief and value. So an example would be you'd say, if you could buy any car in the world, what would you buy? And someone would say, well, I'd buy a, a Prius. OK, well, why would you buy a Prius? Well, it gets great gas mileage. Well, OK, fine. Why is gas mileage important to you? Well. Um, it means I'm protecting the planet. Okay, why is that important to you? Well, because I really feel like I have to not only live here, but my children and grandchildren need to live here. And as you start answering those questions and, and probing deeper, you get to this core belief about why it's important to someone to buy a particular vehicle over another particular vehicle. Uh, we used a firm, an outside company, actually happens to be based in Portland, that does market research with colleges and universities. Um, and they were a great firm. They were great to work with. And they've done this a lot. And one of the things that they noted was that there are a lot of attributes here at this highest level, the beliefs and values level. A lot of times, people answer the questions, and you get these sort of surface level things. And people don't have that sort of core driving commitment to your brand. And so it was unusual for them to see that people went to this highest level of the pyramid you know Maslow's pyramid of, or hierarchy, this is the kind of stuff we're looking at here. So under attributes, I'll just go over some of the very quick ones. This is one that interested me, a real college town feel. Um, for me personally, I didn't associate Eugene as being a real college town. But for students, they really strongly felt like uh, Eugene was what they had in their mind about what a college town was all about. And many students said, I specifically picked the school because I wanted to have a college town experience. I didn't want to necessarily be in a, in a college that was in the middle of nowhere or a, an urban setting where the community doesn't really have any connection to the university. Other kinds of sort of surface level attributes, good value. Even though tuition continues to go up, they still recognize that the University of Oregon is a very good value in comparison, especially to private schools. Um, school spirit, Pac-10 sports, that, those two things were combined. Again, people had a... Um, expectation about what a college experience would be like. And for many students, they said, I wanted to go to a place that has strong school spirit. I wanted to feel like I was part of a group. So that was important to them. Under benefits, as we take it up the ladder here, you know, why are things like school spirit, why is welcoming and open important to you, why is value, diversity, environmental consciousness, why are those things important to you? Well, you get to this next level where you know, it's broadening my horizons. It's helping me reach my potential helping me get a good job. That's a benefit. That's a reason people go to school. Um, it's easy to be green. We heard lots of anecdotal stories about people just being, one of my favorite stories was, uh, if you've ever been to the, uh, to the events in the first of May where we have street fair, they have lots of food vendors. And one of the first things they do as they prepare for street fair is they take large garbage sacks, plastic garbage bags, and they put them over the trash cans so you physically cannot throw your garbage away. You're forced to recycle. And students just think that is the coolest thing in the world, that we are preventing people from throwing things away. We're forcing them to think about what choices they make rather than dropping things in the garbage can to, to figure out how they can recycle. So for them, 
that sort of translates into it really is easy to be environmentally sensitive here and that we are helping people think about the choices that they're making. As we take it up then to the, to the highest level here, the beliefs and values, these are the things that people not even, they don't even necessarily consciously think about them at first and that's why you have to kind of actually be a little obnoxious and keep asking why because you have to start probing and almost subconsciously say what is it that's really driving you? Well, here are the kinds of things that we heard about. This sense of belonging, sense of home, sense of family. Time and again, we heard stories from students who said, I walked on the campus and I felt like I was home. Uh, another great example was a student who said, I'm from Portland. I knew everything there was to know about University of Oregon. I grew up in this state. U of O, I was not interested, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to go there, but my mom forced me to go. So me and my best friend were thrown in the back of the car with my mom and her friend, and the, and the two parents drove us up here to Duck Days, which is coming up in March, by the way, for those who were interested. But you know, we were forced to go to Duck Days, and oh, we just were so angry, and they were just in the back. I could just vision, you know, envision them, their arms crossed and scowling. And they walked on campus and said, wow, I, I guess I don't know the University of Oregon after all. This is a very different place than I had sort of assumed. And through the course of the day, they, they were totally transformed and became ardent supporters of the Ducks, and both of those students are now going to the University of Oregon. So and we heard those kinds of stories many times over, whether a student was coming from the East Coast or whether they were coming from Coos Bay, they really, something about physically getting on campus, there was a sense of welcoming, a sense of, of belonging, and uh, one of the takeaways for us is it's really critical for us to get prospective students here on campus because it makes a big difference. It, it seals the deal. If somebody's got a, even the slightest interest, when they take a tour, there's something about this place that people can really feel even the first time they walk on campus. Other kinds of uh, beliefs and values that are important, um, this idea of in, independence, freedom, self-sufficiency, being empowered, feeling that I'm important, feeling that I make a difference, these are all kind of feelings that, that, that are aroused in students as they go here. So this is the competitive analysis. This is where we looked at the 15 different schools. You can see all their logos around here. They're all schools that you would probably more or less think about if you're thinking about schools that we compete against. And what we wanted to do was to say, we asked a couple questions. One of the questions was, how do they talk about themselves? How do they brand themselves? What do they think are their most important messages? Another thing we wondered is, what are they doing around reputation enhancement or, or branding? Do they have any organized efforts underway? Well, they, well, I'll answer the last question first. There are 15 schools here. 14 of the 15 are currently uh, going through some kind of a branding initiative. They're actively uh, doing work on their brand. So we were not the first ones to the table when it came to this exercise. In fact, we were maybe a little bit behind some of those folks. So it's, it's very appropriate for us to be doing this work because all the other schools we're competing against are doing that as well. But the one that really I, I found really interesting is what were the five common messages? These are five messages that all 15 universities say about themselves. And for those of you in the back who can't read them, let me read them. First one is leading research in, in university, world-class programs and faculty, fosters diversity and strong community, dedicated to public service, and committed to a liberal arts education. I don't know about you all, but I have used all five of those to talk about the University of Oregon. So what this means to me is they are true for the University of Oregon, clearly. However, we cannot rest on those and say these are the five things that make the University of Oregon unique because everybody else we're competing against are trying to make those same claims as well. The other takeaway is that if we do want to talk about our world-class programs or we want to talk about our commitment to a liberal arts education, we need to have really strong proof points. We need to make it very clear that this is not just words, that these are, that here are examples of, of the, how we have world-class programs and world-class faculty. So examples and stories are really going to be critical for us. So I talked briefly about this idea of me with academic leadership. Here's just an example of uh, one of the confidential reports that came out. Actually, this is the, uh, this is the synopsis. but. Uh, uh, U of O staff did not see any of the confidential reports. All we saw was this synopsis. And you get a sense of kind of some of the remarks here. This is one that jumped out at me. 
Uh, it's kind of a Goldilocks situation, not too big, not too small. We heard that, that concept a lot from people that um, you know, we're small enough that you get to know each other, but big enough that uh, you've got 270 different programs and you've got world-class research going on. Um, big enough that you can, you can do this research, but small enough that researchers are almost forced to work interdisciplinary and, and look at different ways of, of uh, attacking problems. And we see that as a real strength and a value for the University of Oregon, that uh, we have, we think, much more interdisciplinary approach to questions than a lot of other schools do just because of the size of the institution where it's sort of forced to partner and there are some, some real benefits that flow out of that. So we looked initially at six different, uh, excuse me, five different audiences as we were putting together these, uh, these themes and these messages. Uh, we had clever names for them, which we've since abandoned because we didn't necessarily need to be clever. But uh, the first was millennials, and those are the, the particular crop of students who are either going to school now or in the process of, of coming to school. Uh, the other are co-pilots, and that name actually is clever, but it also has a real strong um, meaning behind it. You know, parents, the, the co-pilots are the parents, and parents are involved in a very different way these days as students are making decisions about what school to go to than they might have been, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So it's important for us to keep that in mind that, that parents are much, have a much more active role in this process than they may have in the past. Guides was the name we used for high school counselors. We've since decided that this is probably a group that we don't need to focus on for a couple different reasons. One is we know who they are. You know, we know where their offices are. We can physically go meet with them if we had to. Um, so it's, it's uh, the kinds of vehicles we'd use to communicate with students and parents are going to be different than the vehicles we would use to communicate with high school counselors. Plus, uh, there's already great work that admissions does with high school counselors, and it probably wasn't the best use of the limited money that we had to, to spend a lot of time and effort on, on high school counselors. So we dropped them. But givers, obviously, we're interested in our donors and our friends. And then insiders would be faculty and staff. So how did we take all this research and what did we do with it? Well, first thing we did is we came up with themes. These were themes, again, that we tested both through the focus group process and then the online survey. These are the themes in order that they sort of rose from going from here down to here. So the first theme that always rose to the top was academic excellence. That's good news because if that was not the top theme uh, that people used when they thought about the University of Oregon, then we had some real fundamental work that we would have to do. But the good news is, whether it be students or parents or uh, donors or staff and faculty, we all do agree that the University of Oregon has um, ac ac academic excellence is one of the attributes for the University of Oregon. Human scale was another one that we heard again and again from people. This idea that it's, you know, it is small enough that you can walk from corner of campus to corner of campus in 10 minutes or so. It's not so big that you're going to have to jump on mass transit to get from one class to the other. It's small enough that you can run into people at the EMU that you haven't seen for a while and visit, that you're not going to be so physically separated because of size. Uh, welcoming atmosphere we talked about, environmental DNA. Um, this is another one of those themes that came out whenever we ask anybody about the University of Oregon. The, co the concept of green comes up whether it be the color or the concept of, of environmental sustainability. So that's a strong attribute for us. Outstanding programs, a sense of place. This, the, 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 if we unpack that, what, what's behind that is this idea that something interesting is happening on the West Coast. Something interesting is happening in the Pacific Northwest. Something interesting is happening in Oregon, in, in the Willamette Valley, in Eugene. That, at every sort of level, people, there's something about where we are today that attracts people. They find it interesting. They find it, uh, especially for students who are out of the, out of the area, they, they're, they're, they're attracted, they're intrigued, and they want to come and figure out what's happening here. That sense of place also talks about our physical environment. Uh, we hear from a lot of students this idea that it's such a, physically such a green campus. The, the, the trees, the leaves, the flowers, it's such a beautiful, almost like an arboretum is a term people used a lot. Uh, that, that's something that we should really capitalize on when, we, you know, when we're looking at images of campus, for example. We want to communicate the sense that it is a beautiful, uh, 
physically a beautiful place. Supportive community, open to diversity. Diversity, I'll take a quick little segue here. When we did our focus groups, every single focus group, someone brought up the term diversity. They said, this is a really diverse community. And somebody would immediately say, are you kidding? This is the most lily white place I have ever lived in my life. And it would start this debate about, well, what is the definition of diversity? Are we talking about race and ethnicity? For some students, they said, wow, even racially, this is the most diverse place I've ever lived. I come from a small community, and you know, you know, I, this is a very different community for me. But for a lot of people, they talked about this idea of diversity of idea, diversity of thought, um, political affiliation. And these are students who are sort of figuring out where they, where they sit on that political spectrum. And uh, they actually like the idea that they get engaged with people and people challenge them in a positive way to, to think about why they hold beliefs that they hold. And, and those beliefs are sort of, sort of getting set in their heads. So they really like this idea that it is a place where there's a diverse set of ideas um, a diverse set of interests, uh, lots of different kinds of opportunity. They, students get blown away when they find out how many different um, outdoor programs, uh, intramural programs, um, other kinds of activities that they can take part in. So diversity is important. And then world-class athletics. Um, it was, again, we had some great anecdotes from people who said, you know, I have to be honest with you, I actually don't know the rules to football. I love going to the games. I don't really know what's happening, but I know when they score a touchdown, that's a good thing, and you know, we can cheer. But, and this idea, they say, you know, well, I can go to a game, and I'm sitting next to people I've never met before, and they'll score a touchdown, and I'm high-fiving people I've never met before, and I'm hugging my, you know, the person next to me. And other people talk about, you know, I was um, doing a study abroad in Italy, and I had this baseball cap on, and someone from across the way said, go Ducks, and, you know. All those kinds of things are what students look for in a college experience, and that's important to them. Um, the other thing that, that I found a little funny, I guess I'm not that big of a sports fan, but this one student really said, the team wins because I'm there. And, they, and the facilitator said, well, I, you know, do, do you play? And again, the facilitator, was, the facilitator was somebody from Fleischmann Hillard, not a university person. And so she said, honestly, I, are you an athlete? And he said, oh, no, 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 I'm a fan. I'm a member of the pit crew. I go to every basketball game. If I didn't scream and cause the scoreboard to shake, um, you know, the other team would be more successful. So they rely on me. And this person, this was not hyperbole. He honestly believed that he was personally, he played a role in the success of the athletic teams because he was there. Um, you know, they, people use this term of sort of, it was almost like a tribal experience that, you know, we've got something that relates us to each other um, at a certain level. So it's very powerful, and I guess it was eye-opening for me that you know I saw um, intercollegiate athletics as, as a fun diversion, and it's a fun thing for us to get excited about, but I didn't really understand the, the sort of visceral connection that they had. I, I was a graduate of the University of Oregon, and when I went here, the football team wasn't that great, and not many people wanted to sit in the rain on a Saturday, and um, when someone said they were going to the game, they said, Oh, well, yeah, there's a football game this weekend, isn't there? So it was a very different experience. So for students today, when they have successful basketball teams, successful track teams, successful football teams, volleyball, tennis, the list goes on, that's a big deal to them. They really get something out of that. So we took those themes and we put together a positioning statement, and I'll read it again for those of you in the back. A welcoming campus in a beautiful setting that encourages people to be adventurous, and accomplish extraordinary things. Uh, all of these words have lots of meaning packed into them. Welcoming, beautiful setting, adventurous. We've heard that from a lot of people that this is a place where I could really do things that I wouldn't have normally done. You know, gosh, when I was at home with my parents, I would have never done this, um, you know, tried this class, taken this language, done this activity, uh, but now I can be adventurous. And the idea of extraordinary things, there's especially among students, there's this sense that um, I'm at a place where I have the potential to do really amazing things. One, one student talked about Phil Knight and Nike. He said, you know, if some guy who ran track for the University of Oregon could go off and build this huge company, I can do the same thing. He found it really inspirational to him that, you know, somebody who was just a, a lowly student who ran around the track all day had the ability that there was something that was imbued into him 
through his experience at the University of Oregon that, that gave him the gumption to be able to create this, this international company. So under this positioning statement, sort of supported by these concepts, they include new ideas and self-discovery, learning on a human scale, interdisciplinary approach, the history of leadership and social justice, and a resourceful culture. So these are all sort of the underpinnings for this positioning statement. So personality. One of the things we wanted to hear from people is, you know, how would you describe the University of Oregon? If the University of Oregon were a person, or if you were, you, know, you had to use one adjective, what would you say? Um, we got, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds of adjectives, and we sort of distilled those down. This is still a pretty good sized list, but uh, this gives you an idea of, um, as you look at these as a whole, how people perceive the University of Oregon. Original, independent, individualistic, goal-oriented, I'll just stop right there. When I hear those, I think about the Oregon Trail, and I think about what was it that caused people, caused some farmer in Missouri to say, I'm buying a wagon and some oxen, I'm loading up my family and everything we can carry in this wagon, and we're gonna go hundreds and thousands of miles over mountain ranges to this place I've never been before, and it's gonna be a better place. I mean, that, that's pretty impressive when you think about it. I don't think I would load up my family in the back of the minivan and say, we're moving to Missouri because there's something cool there. So there's something about this Oregon, um, Jim, have you been to Missouri? My, okay. <laughs> no, no offense to Missouri, but um, you know, this idea of being independent and original, that just, you know, here we are generations later, and I think that's still, that ethic still flows through the veins of Oregonians. Unconventional, adventurous, progressive, inclusive, friendly, fun, the list goes on and on, experimental. So those are the kinds of stories that we should be telling. If we hear a story like that of a student who has done something that's smart or something that they're proud about or something that's been unconventional, we should tell that story. Likewise, if we have faculty members who are uh, taking an unconventional approach to a problem and, and coming up with discoveries that wouldn't have been found if they had been more traditional, more conventional. Those are the kinds of stories that really illustrate who the University of Oregon is. I think we'll, this is a really small slide, so I'm not gonna go into it. We've got some cards on your, t on your chairs that we'll go over in a second that has a lot of this information in it. And this is one of the things that'll be in the cards too. We put together this little graphic here, the core promise. Here's the core promise. If you're gonna send a student to the University of Oregon, what kind of experience are they gonna have? Well, we say that the University of Oregon delivers open, welcoming opportunities for academic excellence and personal exploration in a progressive, ideal college town. Now, just like diversity, this word progressive generates lots of interest and, and excitement, and people say, well, progressive, you're talking about liberal versus uh, conservative, and no, the idea of progressive is using the fullest possible definition of what progressive means. This idea, again, maybe harkening back to the example of the Oregon Trail, that people are striving, they're, they're, they're moving forward, they want to go somewhere where they can make a difference. Um, so this idea of progressive has, has a very deep and rich definition, and it's not sort of the label that we typically jump to when we think of the term progressive. So on the outside of this core promise, we have some key themes. Uh, and again, these key themes you'll find in that card, that Z card at your chair. We can walk through that in a second. But these key themes are themes that would work for any audience. So whether you're talking to a donor or a prospective student or a parent or a faculty or a staff member, those key themes are things that work. The gray circle are secondary themes that are probably more geared toward a specific audience. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a second. Last thing I'll say on this part is that uh, now that we've put together this messaging, we have these themes, we've identified this framework that we're operating in, we have a group that we refer to as the Brand Council that's helping us make sure that, we, that the next steps we make um, are the right steps for the University of Oregon. We don't want to be doing this sort of in isolation. So we have a broad cross-section of folks. We have deans, we have people from the Alumni Association, people from the athletic uh, department, uh, faculty members, who are on this uh, band council that are helping guide this effort as we uh, move from the work that we've done now into more of the execution phase. So how do we tell our story? 
One of the things we did is we put together a variety of tools for people. One of those tools is what we refer to as the communications guide, the pocket communications guide. And that's the, uh, the little card you have at your table or at your chair. We have lots of these. If you have coworkers who you think might be interested in some of this stuff and they don't, uh, they weren't able to come, let us know. We can get you more. On one side here, we have what we call the U of O message map. So there are, actually, let me start here. On the front side, we have our key messages. These are messages, again, that would work regardless of who the audience is. Could be faculty members, it could be prospective students. So these work for everybody. If you go on the back, there are specific messages that resonate with particular audiences. So you'll see we've got uh, messages for students, for parents, faculty and staff, and donors and alumni. The other thing you'll see in here, key themes down here. This is that graphic that I just showed a second ago that you can take a look at at your, at your leisure. And then at the bottom, we had those lists of attributes, those, those descriptors, like individualistic, goal-oriented. Those are on the bottom of the card as well. This card is something I would encourage you to take home, stick in your drawer. If you ever have to write about the University of Oregon, if you ever have to speak about the U of O, if you're writing a web page and you're sort of at a loss of where to go, Pull this out, take a minute or two just to refresh your memory about what are those kinds of attributes that we think are important. And uh, that will help you, I hopefully, make sure that your writing or your, your spoken communications is true to the U, U of O brand. The other thing we did is we put together a manual. It's this document here. We have it as in a hard copy. For those people who would use this on a weekly basis, um, and you want to have a hard copy, let us know. We can get you one. For those of you who think you'll be using it yeah, on a monthly basis or, or less frequently, it's available online. It's probably a little bit easier just to keep it online for you. Uh, we'll go over that in a second. This is a document that uh, so originally we referred to as our style guide. It had two different sections in it. It talked about how to use the U of O logo and um, had some grammar and usage uh, recommendations in there. Well, we took that and said, this needs to be much more than just about the logo. We need to talk about uh, what the messaging is. We need to talk about how we communicate visually about the University of Oregon. So we took this from two sections to 11 sections. It now runs about 150 pages, so it's packed with information. And um, I'm already going along, so I'm going to stop here in a second. But we'll have a chance to walk a little bit more through this. Um, sort of the, the keeper and the developer of the guide is Colin Miller, who is the uh, the director of design and editing services for the university. And so Colin is the expert on this, but it's a beautifully, it, it looks beautiful and it's packed with information. So Colin can talk about that in a second. So let me talk about kind of work in progress. We've done the work around messaging. Another thing we did is another tool is we, we talked about, uh, as we discussed this work, about how we communicate visually. And the University of Oregon had a particular visual style. Um, and we think that we need to look at that style, maybe tweak it a little bit, and Colin might have an opportunity to walk us through some of the attributes of what we would look for for pictures moving forward. But we actually brought a photographer on board to kind of help us set the, um, set the standard for what we would like to use in the future. So we have a number of images that are available in, in the library that design and editing services can make available. Uh, the U of O libraries have a number of images available as well if you're not able to find something from Colin and his team. Um, put together a variety of tools like the different guides. We're doing training and awareness. That's what we're doing today. The last thing that we're going to be focusing on for sure this year is um, television and radio spots. For those of you who've ever watched a football game or a basketball game on TV sometime in the last five years, uh, you've probably seen this cool O ad. Um, it's, it's a perennial favorite, but it's getting an, a little bit long in the tooth. Typically, an ad should be used maybe two years, and then you go get a new one. Well, we just haven't had the money to do that. And so we've been using the same spot now for five years, um, and it's definitely time for us to update that. We did have the ability to take some of the money that we were using for our branding initiative, and we refreshed this spot for the, um, the Civil War game against Oregon State uh, in early December. That was a nationally televised game, and we thought, OK, we need to put our best foot forward. And then also, uh, we refreshed it for the Rose Bowl. And it's probably important to note, too, that uh, when you have a nationally televised game, you are given a free 30 seconds of time in that broadcast to have some kind of a message. 
Uh, the University of Oregon doesn't have to pay for that. All we have to do is to pay for the ad. And there is no way we could ever afford to actually advertise on television nationally. Um, so this is a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to get our um, brand in front of, I think in the case of the Rose Bowl, who, what was the, the three million viewers? Yeah. Something like three and a half million yeah. viewers. So a whole lot of people had the opportunity to see this spot. Now let me just very quickly walk us through one section of the how we tell our story guide. All right, so here is our guide. As I mentioned, there are, tw there are 11 different sections in here. I'm just going to give you a highlight of what kinds of things you'll find in this guide. Information about brand positioning, information about university marks, that's how you properly use the logo. I talked about visual style, um, some, a creative toolkit. Uh, if you have needs that have to do with graphic design, Collins Shop can definitely help you. Occasionally, however, something comes up and you either don't have the time or necessarily have the money to do the work uh, with Collins Shop, and you might have to be doing it yourself. Well, if that's the case, take a look at this creative toolkit gives you some great examples of how you can um, create a visual style that's going to be consistent with the guide. In fact, um, McClure at, or Paul McClure, Paul? No. Adam Tull McClure. McClure used that style to create some of the ads that they'll be walking through here in a second. Um, another thing that I would just point out to you is information here about web communication standards. Susan's going to be doing another workshop around social media. There's some good information here about um, how to use social media in your marketing communications programs, other information about how to prepare websites and some tools that you can use as you're building, actually physically building the pages. Okay, I'm going to go very quickly through here, but here, but before I do, well, I can't really see that, unfortunately, it's dark, but here's an example of when we talked about this sense of place and how beautiful and green it was. These are, this is one of the images that uh, was taken during our photography session where if you, if it wasn't so dark, you'd see that there's a person right there, uh, but, but really surrounded by beautiful green and, and some fall colors. Again, this is information you have in your Z card about kind of who we are. This is one section I want to call to your attention, this idea of using the right voice. When you're writing or speaking about the University of Oregon, there's two things to keep in mind. First is, what kind of a tone are you using? And the second is, what's the content? So the tone talks about these things like you want, you want a voice that's in friendly, that's maybe a little less formal depending on who your audience is. If you're, if you're asking for a donor for a gift, an informal voice may not be appropriate. But if you're talking to prospective students, uh, especially if, you, if any of, those of you are familiar with some of the work that the admissions office has done in recent years, they have a very sort of conversational, friendly um, tone to them. Um, they, they are speaking directly to prospective students in a voice that prospective students would recognize. So that's the idea of tone. You know, you want it to be, you want it to re really reflect the personality of the University of Oregon. The other thing is content, and then content really gets at what we have there in that Z card, in that com pocket communications guide. You know, what are the examples that prove the point that the University of Oregon is um, committed to environmental responsibility or um, that it's a welcoming place. You know, th those are the kinds of stories, the anecdotes you want to include. Here's our key themes. You've seen this before. Key messages. This is the U of O message map. Again, you have that in the back of your pocket guide. This is the last thing that I wanted to highlight, and then I'll turn it over to Colin. So how do you know if you're actually being successful? How do you know if you're communicating the extraordinary opportunities for learning in a welcoming environment? Well, here's a series of six different questions that you can ask yourself. Um, as you're looking at your piece and you're about to hit send or you're about to finalize your PowerPoint presentation, you should ask yourself, you know, are you using stories that associate University of Oregon with higher aspirations, that um, communicate a sense of forward thinking, progressiveness, 
um, celebrating people's unique viewpoints and perspectives. Can any other academic institution make the same claim? And if the answer is yes, are you using specific anecdotes that demonstrate why the University of Oregon is unique and can really lay claim to that, that particular statement? Do you use language that incorporates the U of O promise or our messages? Uh, do you incorporate one or more of our personality traits? So there's six questions here. If you can answer yes to one or more of those questions, then chances are you're on track and you are, um, you know, you're definitely embracing the concept of the brand management or the reputation enhancement efforts that we're doing here. So with that, I've probably talked longer than I should. Anybody have any questions before I turn it over? All right, thank you. Let me turn it over to Colin. start with the logo. Um, really nothing about the logo or its use has changed um, in this edition. Uh, it still has all the same elements that are required and um, the same clear space, uh, color variations. Uh, so really, I mean, I guess what I would like is if anybody has questions as we go, I know it's been sort of one way here, but if uh, if anybody has questions about usage or, or the rules or you know, just any general questions, please shout them out because uh, there isn't a lot new in this section. I'm, and I'm just going to whip through as fast as I can and highlight uh, the parts of the guide that are new. But I, I really crave questions if anybody has them. Stacked version, same. Um, the big change, I suppose, in the logo section is a, we're reverting, I guess, to a, a University of Oregon logo first in the secondary signatures. Uh, at some point, how many years ago? Five, seven years ago, there was a uh, switch. Uh, secondary logos were um, started with business, so Lundquist College of Business would be on the first line, and University of Oregon was on the second line. I, I had several units come to me and say, we can't operate like this. It, it creates confusion and it's kind of backwards and we're sending out some things with this version of the logo and some things with a different version of the logo. And uh, so there are about, how many were there? That many secondary logos that were all reversed. So we've turned them, we've changed them back. The other ones are still out there. You'll see them, you'll use them. But these are the ones that are preferred puts the university back in its position at the top of the logo. Any questions about that? Where are they getting these? Where are they getting these? These or these? Or the others? Um, at the end of this, there's a section on where all the resources are. There's, there are servers that have all these on them. New Portland logos. We prefer people use this top one for stationary and general use. This one on the bottom was developed for uh, those times where it's the only element there is, like a collection of sponsor logos or um, uh, sort of standalone marketing efforts. Use that one. And these are the secondary signatures, signatures for Portland, which have an extra element. University College Portland. This is all standard from last time. I'll stop here unless anybody has questions. Bad things not to do. <laughs> Which is my favorite? This one. The filling of the O with whatever 
it's just it's uh, not a preferred thing to do. <laughs> uh, we call these affiliate marks. Uh, you know, the Foundation and the Alumni Association are technically owned by the university, if that's the right way to say it. So, but they participate in a very close way. So they have uh, these sort of secondary signatures that are, were made for them. The bookstore has one now too. The seal. Um, there is still seal stuff available. Many academic units prefer it on their stationery. Um, but we're trying to uh, limit a bit, I guess, the use of the seal to presidential, uh, ceremonial type of things. So, um, you know, uh, diplomas, the president's inauguration that'll be coming out, that kind of thing. We really ask that people don't uh, alter the seal, screen it, crop it, weird colors, whatever. <coughs> Any questions about the seal? Colors, despite what you've seen on the football field, our colors have not changed. Um, athletics has their own section in here with the colors that have kind of morphed a bit. Um, just call me if you have questions about any of the colors. Uh, our complementary color philosophy has changed a little. We used to have a section that showed a lot of colors that were available for complementary colors. We really don't prescribe those anymore. All we sort of ask is that green and yellow are your major colors. Complementary colors can be anything. Um, and we've made a l small list here of the, what we consider the largest, most visible, I suppose, competitors where if you use red and yellow as your primary colors, it's going to be confused with a different school. So. Our typefaces have not changed. It's still Melior, Accidents. Find those on our servers. I'll get to that at the end. Um, but you're not restricted to those two. We ask that you use them for your body text, captions, all the little things, and for headlines and other things where where you does the, where you desire. Um, but these are some examples that show that you can use other fonts that that sort of uh, you know will represent your your look and feel. Um, we consider these pieces branded to the University of Oregon. It's got Amelia accidents, our colors. It's got, uh, except for the orange one, I guess. And uh, our logo at the bottom. But it's just an example of uh, font use. Some typographical do's and don'ts. That's not new. Um, now, as Phil was talking about, our photography uh, has changed a little bit. We asked Fleischmann Hiller to come up with um, a series of, of uh, concepts, I guess. And really, it's like it's a laundry list of, of good photographic technique. Um, I think the major point made here is that we're really looking for realism, uh, the real settings, the real emotion at the bottom, uh, sort of capture that we like things candid and less staged. The, the one point uh, is to avoid looking at the camera. I think that's probably the one that we'll have to fight the hardest uh, as we go through taking photos. It's very tempting to use or take photos of just people looking back at the camera, but we're really hoping that there will be more uh, activity and engagement um, in other ways. You know, Colin, if I could just jump in there. That, that question about looking at the camera, uh, it, it depends on the particular uh, image that you're using. So for example, if you're doing a profile on a student or a profile on a faculty member, it might make perfect sense for them to be looking right at you, you know, through the camera into your own eyes. That, that's perfectly fine. But uh, when you're talking, you know, when you have more of a uh, shot that's not focused on an individual, it's probably better to try and avoid having them looking at the camera. We want the sense that, that these are real slice of life kinds of Images that they're not things with models that have been, you know, brought in and and, and quaffed and and prepared for this that picture. Um, that what we're literally looking for is a sense of authenticity because um, we want the real the, the true U of O personality to come through in those images. 
I guess a lot of it is a reaction to some of the pieces we see, you know, that 16 page newsletter with people, they're all the same, sort of staring back at you. So, so it's, you know, to mix it up a bit is what we're headed for, looking for. Stationary, I'm not going to stop here for anything. This has not changed. Um, it's all basically the same. Stop me if you really want to see something. Uh, these publications just show uh, the, the proper use of the O. Um, these are first edition slides from, from the guide. They still work because they show positioning of the logo and how it's not the, um, it's not your main message, the logo. It shouldn't be used as lead art ever or lead headline. It's just uh, a pleasant signifier. The guide has stuff about self-mailers, return address, all the specifications, um, which is, I mean, it's pretty boring, but if you do it wrong, you get in big trouble. <laughs> I know about it. Uh, this is the creative toolkit Phil was talking about earlier. Um, these aren't required designs. These, this is a, a selection of uh, different kinds of pieces that can be used if you don't have better idea or another idea or something that fits your group better, your unit. Um, and there's a, you know, this whole book was built on this grid. Tim put it together. So it works. Anything else you want to say about this? Well, one thing I would flag, too, is if you look at, uh, I'm going to stop right there. Look at this. this so we refer to this as sort of a curtain effect. Uh, where you've got two different images, one on top of the other. And typically what we want with that curtain effect is we want to have two opposing images that describe the same thing. So it could be that you've got, um, you can't really see this very well, but here's a picture of one individual person clearly indoors, and then you've got a whole group of people who are outdoors, um, out in the woods somewhere. So this idea of maybe one person versus a group of people, or indoors versus outdoors, um, with that curtain effect sort of becoming a, a visual identifier that this is a University of Oregon PowerPoint or a publication or whatever the case may be. And in fact, I think you'll see in some of the ads that we're going to talk about at the end, they've employed, employed that curtain effect. Yeah. return address stuff. Uh, we found it better to line with the line on other things. Can you see any of this? It's kind of hard to see. So these are the different uh, web ads and uh, other things. I guess the, uh, the one thing I'd like to mention to this group anyway is that if uh, we would like to refrain from you doing your organ quarterly ad in this mode because we wouldn't like them all to look the same all the way through Oregon quarterly. So this is something specific. I do have a PowerPoint template that I constructed. Did it work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so if you need that, just get that from me. Athletics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on athletics. Is there anybody from athletics here? No? Uh, they've got of their own set of rules. They are a very close sort of audience. Uh, football fans, basketball fans are a sort of select group. Um, when the football team rolls out with the new uniform on Saturday, there's three guys in the booth that can uh, explain everything. So they kind of have their own set of rules. Basically, it includes uh, nobody else using any of this stuff unless they ask athletics or marketing and brand management. So all those people if you have an interest in any of this. And it includes that font. This is a proprietary font for uh, athletics. So nobody else can really use that. 
Oh, and there's their new colors. Or I can't tell. It's a lot darker green and a lot lighter yellow. That's what it amounts to. <coughs> Web standards. Come, there's three sections. One is the uh, home page. And we didn't explain the whole thing here. You can go online and look and see what the current uh, guidelines are and how to get involved in that. Although there's probably not a lot of involvement to have. Well, one of the things is we were, as we were preparing this guide, it became real clear that, especially with web standards, things are evolving so quickly that as soon as we committed it to paper, we knew that there would be some other technology that would replace whatever we had written. So we decided to make you know, take advantage of the web and, and use that as the place to really be the repository for whether it's the web standards, homepage information, uh, best practices for social media. Uh, those can all be found at those URLs, and they're updated very frequently. So if you ever are um, a complaint of social media campaign, for example, it's probably a good idea to visit the site and just see if things have changed, see if there's any new tips, any new tricks that you can learn from the, those sites. <coughs> we did go into some detail about uh, the websites. A lot of it is around accessibility. Um, there's very little here that will the required design elements are right there. That's it. Uh, banner on top, so if you will signature is about it for requirements, um, along with uh, the color and logo uh, instructions from the rest of the book. The rest of it is, uh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, I think it's fitting. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, the web guidelines are a lot of, uh, I guess, a bit repetitious of the other uh, guidelines about fonts and uh, colors, but we wanted this to stand alone. Stop me if you have questions about this. Uh, Google Analytics, <coughs> instructions for that, instructions for search engine optimization, all the stuff that will help you uh, sort of analyze and uh, succeed with your sites. And then resources at the end. Who to call for different things. Okay, the additional information. This is where you get your map help. Uh, infographics lab, <coughs> part of the uh, Department of Geography. Great maps. They make outstanding stuff. We always go to them when we need the best maps. Uh, some fine print about logos and printing. Recycled paper. You can read this at your leisure, I guess. Exciting. Uh, equal opportunity statement. This should appear on everything we do. Um, and there's some rules on which <coughs> words to use, what, how to put it together. If you've got an event, uh, it needs to have a number to call to accommodate people with disabilities for when they call looking for accommodation. Ads can use the very short one right at the bottom there. You know, I was, uh, I, when I first got here, I, I wondered as I was putting this thing on the on everything I made, it said this publication will be made available to accessible form, in an accessible format upon request. I didn't know what that meant. It's kind of scary. Like if somebody calls and they need it in Braille or on tape, or am I, what do I do? So I called Affirmative Action to ask, well, what if, what are the rules for this? What do we do that someone should call? And they said, just call us. I said, okay, what? then what? Just call us. So put it on your stuff, and if anybody calls, call affirmative action. They'll take care of it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, their number's not on here. The, the number that's for accommodations will usually be someone in your department because those kind of accommodations are around uh, wheelchair access, um, uh, sign language, that kind of thing, which would be your responsibility to, as if someone putting on an event, get that stuff. That's for a brochure. A brochure, you wouldn't put the accommodations in bit because there's nothing to, it's just for events, you know, uh, seminars, plays, conferences. Uh, that, 
formats is for everything. Uh, then beyond that, the event one, the number to call is for conferences. And so that kind of thing. Phil talked about diversity. Um, we have not solved that here. We taken a bit from the diversity plan. And you know, just this page is just to generate thought, consideration. It's not something we are going to solve right away. And lastly is the grammar and style guide. This I would encourage you to read. It's very exciting. It's very interesting. It also has all the answers to all the questions that, as writers, you have when you're wondering about capitalization and punctuation and ampersands and um, all of that. We routinely fix uh, the stuff as it comes through our office. And, uh, you know, I would say 75% of our changes are just style. Um, we sort of want to talk with one voice. And this is, you know, these strategies are the way to do it. So I would read through this. I read through it a couple times. It's answered a lot of questions. When I start writing things, questions about that? <clears throat> and at the end, we have some, uh, how to refer to Portland, University of Oregon in Portland. Um, there's some specific ways to refer to that. That's here. reading marks, editing marks, and some fact checking and stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, using the University of Oregon uh, themes and logo and all the rest, it's kind of difficult when you're trying to uh, also put your own look and feel into it. It's, it's a difficult chore, we, but we do it all the time. And if you need any help with it, come talk to us. We will design your piece, we'll critique your piece, we'll help you with interpretation of the guides. Whatever you want uh, us to do, we'll do. So I've got my cards back there. Um, our website is des.uoregon.edu. It'll have all the, the style guide link. It'll have um, uh, ways to get logos, um, the affirmative action stuff. What am I missing? What else? Uh, job request form for us, thank you. Uh, how do you get jobs through our system? Well, 
Um, I've been a partner at Adams Hall for the past half dozen years, um, involved in the University of Oregon Alumni Association on the Board of Directors of the Wayne County Chapter, and the incoming, get this title, Chairman of the Eugene Chamber of Commerce Economic Development Council. Really looking forward to getting that business card to be long and skinny. Um, you may not be familiar with Adams Hall and Floor, but you probably have seen some of our U of O work through the years. It's been fortunate to be able to work with the Alumni Association on video and print pieces, U of O uh, Presidential Gala Awards in Portland, the Bach Festival, some work with the libraries, and most recently U of O Market, Marketing and Brand Management Division. We sell everything from jets to jeans to education, we like to say. And the same process that we're going to go through today here it's the same process that works when we're trying to sell jeans at Coastal Farm Ranch in Oregon, Washington. It's the same process we use for selling jets at Cafe and Flightcraft. And it's the same process we use for selling the university to a prospective student, to our internal audience, to alumni, to donors, to the business community. Um, Moving on the slides here. Our creative process is the next slide. It all starts with words. And as silly as that sounds, it starts with that blank piece of paper. And that's how we start. We would encourage you to do the same, same thing. Um, and then there's an element of critical thinking. And you're really lucky. Everybody in this room here today is a critical thinker. There's a lot of subjective judgment. This guide doesn't tell you how to build your ad. It gives you suggestions. And, and everybody, it, it should be used as a roadmap and a template but you get to be a critical thinker along the way and elevate your ad to be the best it can possibly be. So the, the first step, and what we're gonna go, we're gonna go through determining your target for the ad, using the right words, finding the right images, and then hopefully putting them together. So we kinda got four steps we're gonna walk through here and how we came up with some of these ads. You'll see the three ads we came up with the Rose Bowl, walk through how the ultimate ad was selected. So first, kind of obvious, Target. Who are you trying to reach with your ad? With my silly example earlier, if you're having a bake sale and you're the um, School of Architecture, probably trying to reach students, maybe faculty. And this, you know, the, the process we go through is there's a big difference in talking to parents, students, alumni, faculty, community members, business leaders. And part of the way that you determine who the target is is next slide. Uh, through the media purchase. Where's your ad going to be seen? If it's in the Emerald, obviously it's an internal audience or student audience. If it's in a community newspaper, you're going to, need, you're going to have a community message to it. If it's in a trade publication, it's going to be more for faculty or possibly um, some of our competitors. The other thing is through content. Simple. What are you trying to say? And if you use that filter, what medium am I using, and what's the content, what's the message, it will help you develop a target. As an ad guy, kind of one of the worst things that you can hear is everybody's our target. Because if everybody's your target, it's going to fall flat. You have to figure out exactly who you're going after. And each of these ads here, if we go through them, you'll see they do have a very specific target. And the guy really helps us get here. We've got three examples. This ran in the new February Portland Monthly, which is a side note. It says there's 630 public and private schools which is kind of crazy when you think, but you wonder why this matters. Why does this guide exist? It's because if we don't do it right, if all of our messaging, the messages we're able to work on, and the message all of you are able to work on, if we're not all on the same page, there's 629 other guys that might be on the same page. So hopefully one plus one plus one equals 10 if we're all on the same page. So in this case, this app obviously was recruitment based. Um, Nice, nice image, good headline. Actually, it's probably worth reading the copy on. The University of Oregon is more than the sum of its outstanding academic programs, game-changing research, and numerous honors. It's, the first, it's first and foremost about people innovating and collaborating to make a difference in the world. Our energetic students, together with their passionate faculty, are working to help shape the future. The University of Oregon, where ideas and people are born to fly. And I think you understand having sat through uh, Phil and Colin's points, where that came from. We didn't just make that up. That came from your focus group. That came from the style guide. And it all comes together nicely in those three or four key sentences. So that's it's a good example of a uh, recruitment ad. The next slide shows a community ad. In this case, it was going to be running in the Sunday newspaper. We had a, a couple of very simple messages. We wanted everybody to know we have a new president. We wanted everybody to know some of his key thoughts 
and we wanted people to know we had an event coming up with some specific uh, information, perfectly targeted towards a general community audience in the uh, Sunday newspaper. And the third slide here, a final slide, this is a good example of a business to business ad. This ran in the uh, sustainable organ section of the Portland Business Journal recently. So in this case, we knew that we were talking to a business crowd who wanted to position the university as being a business leader and have a bit of a sustainable message. As we keep talking about, it's all a process. And this guide is here to help guide you through that process. This is a wonderful example of the process really working out. The initial headline for this ad was saving the world one mind at a time. So it's kind of too heavy. And I think, Susan, it was you that said, what if it becomes, uh, what if it becomes changing the world? And it instantly became a much better app. That's the process. These, we're not doing our job if we just show up and, or, or if you just go, put out here's the app. It needs to be a process with your team, working with the marketing brand management, working with whomever you want to have on your team. It ends up with a much better app, as this is a, a good example of. So we figured out the target for your app. The next thing is, what's the objective? And that's probably the most important thing that you'll hear today. And it's the thing that I'm reminded on a daily basis. Um, critical message is the most important thing. What if it's on a television ad, or a piece of collateral, or in a print ad, what is it that you're trying to say? It doesn't matter how pretty your ad is. It doesn't matter how evocative the photography is. If it doesn't, have, if it doesn't make sense, what are you trying to convey? Uh, we all see those studies on a regular basis. But the average person sees uh, you know, 500 messages a day, 3,000 messages a day, a zillion. I mean, there's, there's a million studies out there, but we all know that people are inundated with ads. So if your ad for your event or what you're trying to accomplish doesn't have a key message, it's going to get lost in that clutter that exists out there. So how do you do that? You have to figure out what that key impression is that you want to leave when somebody does turn the page. What's most critical? What style or tone? In this case, it's back to the guy, guy here. You go, oh, that style or tone, that sounds really hard. It's not if you use this. If you go to page, I believe it's 18. That looks familiar. That was one of the things that uh, both Phil and Paul went over. It's U of O message map. Student messages, parent messages, faculty and staff messages, top donor and alumni messages. So when you figure out who you're targeting, you can be using the same messages as all your colleagues to all of our ads, one plus one plus one equals five. There it is. Write creatively. And that, and that, I mean, you know, just have fun with it. Put something on paper, and it's just a process. Put something for a little while, something that stands out, not just who, what, when, where. That can be in your ad at some point down the road. Um, it needs to be big, it needs to stand out, it needs to be fun. And how do you do that? Once again, you go to style, style guide on page 15. Those are the key themes that came out of those focus groups. Academic excellence, welcoming atmosphere, human scale, open to diversity, supportive community, unique sense of place, world-class athletics, environmental DNA. And here's an example. This is how we actually came up with this ad. Once again, what we did, we I think it was seven of them, we found we include talk about human scale, welcoming atmosphere. And this is where it started. We read the copy where it ended, but where it started on the first day was, were you born the fly? Did you know it from the start? Or was it someone who helped you with an idea? Could it have been when you first realized being different was good? Or that a community could offer you a sense of place? At the University of Oregon, we know it's hard to keep your feet on the ground when you were born the fly. That put all of those keywords into it, and then through the process, it became the final ad that we read there. Once it, it kept all those key themes in there. So I don't want to say the ad's writing itself, but you see by going through this process, by using the guide, it really does provide a roadmap, it makes it easy, and ultimately elevates your final work. Write three versions. We believe that choice is a good thing. What we give our clients, but also when you have to show your ad to your supervisor, to your boss, editing, design services, have some options. If you don't have options, it becomes a crisis. If we present an ad to a client on a Friday and we say, well, here's your ad, and it's gonna run Sunday, it doesn't give them a lot of choices. But if you have multiple choices, it allows you to it, it mitigate the risk, 
make sure that, that your key message gets told in an appropriate way and you don't have to compromise. So in this case, here's the copy with the born to fly ad that we talked about. Then there was another one, and you'll see the art direction on that later, and a third one, all of which were built for the Rose Bowl, all using the same key messages, but approaching it from a different angle. Last on this list, work in an environment can instead of can't. This guy is not meant to be your enemy, it's meant to be your friend. This is, you have to know when to push the limits. You have to shoot as high as you can because if you don't, through, unfortunately, through committees, through time, through, everything gets watered down over time. When we, we like to say, when we uh, dub a television commercial for a station, we always put it on the highest quality tape we can and use original files because by the time we dub it, and it goes to the station and they encode it and it bounces off a translator somewhere in the Coburg Hills and to Comcast and runs through a wire to your house and you TiVo it and watch it later. Suddenly our really crisp commercial, it might not look so good. Thank goodness we started as good as possible because by the time it gets to your house, hopefully it's affluent. The same is true as you build these apps. You have to shoot as high as you can. What you can do, you, if you compromise by the time it actually shows up in the daily end world, it's probably not going to meet your critical message or be successful for you. So now we've got all the words figured out. So now it's time to figure out what the image is. And this process is even easier thanks to the style guide. First, you just have to kind of close your eyes and say, what do I see? What do I want, what do I want this ad to actually physically look like now that we know what it says? Place to start is the uh, viewable approach of photography with Colin covered. And this basically is just a reminder of what good photography is. And I forget it every day. I think it's actually next slide. So yeah, there it is again. You know, good photography is in real settings. It's not when somebody's looking straight at the camera. There's action, there's emotion, there's an unusual environment. So remind yourself of that, which takes us to the next slide, where we highly encourage you to go to iSoft Photo. Completely free, awesome website. I keep saying if you only hear one thing today, so I guess this is my third if you only hear one thing today. Bookmark iStock Photo, great site. You can see what it looks like here. Thousands and thousands of pictures, it's wild. You can go to iStock Photo and type in blue pumpkin and there's like a thousand pictures of blue pumpkins. You, it doesn't matter, it's like Google, you can't trick it. There's always something that matches what you're looking for. So if you know, so you're looking for something that's evocative based on what you saw in here, and you go type it in, you can download it from free comps, print them out, and then take them to call it, take them to editing design services. Here's a good example. These are both iStock images. Portland, student, and then as you've seen, put up, there's the app. It doesn't look like stock photography. That looks, that looks like it was custom built just for this purpose, and the same can be true of your ad as well. So schedule an appointment with Colin and his team to review the, those photos so they have a better idea of what you're looking for. Because if you just say, I'm having a pie eating contest um, you know, outside of our uh, office next week, you, eh, that doesn't give me a lot of information. But if you show them some photos that you like, well, okay, this is a kid, that's a blueberry pie, they're smiling and happy and it's a summery day. You can have a better idea because the UFO has access to thousands and thousands of images already. There you go. Now here, most of us are not photography geeks. I'm certainly not. I don't understand necessarily the difference between a good image and great image. But if you work with Colin and his team, they'll help you know the difference between a good image and a great image. Here's an example on the next one. I think it's a pretty good image. It's, you know, nice looking girl. She, you put, you know, if you put this on the left hand page, you know, it looks like she's looking up into the other copy. It's pretty effective. If you click again, this is the stuff that Colin and his team will tell you that makes this a great photograph. You've got room to crop it. You've got space down here where you can put some type reverse out. You've got space for the UFO logo. That's all the stuff that he'll be able to say, yeah, this is a great photograph. Or be able to take something and say, you know, let's not use this one. Let's find another one instead. The curtain design, page 75. I believe it's the next slide. There it is. So what this complicated little grid does is it makes it, it make sure that your ad can be balanced. And Colin and the team can help you with this. And also gives you a limit of how much copy you can put in an ad. And for a guy like me, that's a good thing. Because otherwise you go, well, I want to write up this and this and this. And pretty soon you got eight paragraphs of copy. If you use the curtain, 
it kind of gives you a word budget, and all of a sudden it helps you edit your own ad downs. We talked about how it all starts with words. This is where you go, okay, I got 200 words that are great, but space for 100, so you got to figure out where to whack. And then in here, there's also three generally accepted uh, design styles. Exceptions, of course, exist, such as we're talking about. We don't want working quarterly every ad to look exactly the same. This is where you, hopefully it all comes together. That aha moment. You got your copy, you got your headline, you got your awesome evocative image, and hopefully it comes together. And you look at it and you go, bam, this rocks. If it doesn't, it probably means you need to go back and reevaluate one of your pieces along the way. So here we are. These are the three ads that were prepared for the Rose Bowl. Um, each of which has merits, each of which was greatly debated internally, and each of which has that aha moment. If you're in Southern California, if you're in Southern California, it's kind of smoggy, big, crowded, and you're sitting at the Rose Bowl, and you got your Rose Bowl program, which was 190 pages, 198 pages, that's pretty awesome. That looks like a place that you want to send your kid, or a place that you want to go teach. The Born to Fly ad, great recruitment ad. And then the ad that was ultimately selected, and the, because of the shading, you can't really see it there. I've talked about the, the two looks here. It talks about on and off the field, and you've got the blending of the classroom, and then a shot from Austin Stadium underneath. And ultimately, that was decided that was the best thing to convey the critical URL message and brand at the Rose Bowl. What bigger opportunity was there for you to, to have an impact on prospective donors, students, faculty, retention, everything all at the same time? Okay, this is kind of the nuts and bolts part here. You got to make sure that the basic information is in your ad if you're having an event. So this is back to you on the bake sale and you want to have an ad in the envelope. Uh, just last week, I messed this stuff up. We were doing an ad for an event that was happening at the Wayne County Fairgrounds. And I didn't put the Lane County Fairgrounds part in, and Derek said, well, don't we need to put the location? Oh, everybody knows where it is. Uh, Brent, I don't have a clue. That's why you go through the stuff. And once again, it's, in fact, it's not just in the guide to, to make it harder. It's there to remind me, and you can do it. So you got to make sure that your times are in there, location, phone, put your website, and then the uh, equal opportunity ADA requirements. And when Derek and I have talked about some of these UMO ads. I said, well, that just needs to be in the big ads, right? And Derek said, no, no, Brent, that needs to be in all the ads. So, okay, well, that doesn't need to be in the small little ads that are just for the base sale, no rent call. It's about the eighth time I figured out it goes in all the ads. Not some of the ads, but all the ads. Here's an example of for a small space ad, sort of short version for larger ads. You got two lines of copy there. So, is that, my, is that correct column that's every ad, which I thought every ad, well, it's got to be, where's the asterisk? But apparently every means every. And then the obvious proofreading. So here's an example from this ad over here with President Riviere. Free admission, public welcome, date, location, time, and a web address. See, it's really nice when all the stuff that you put on the slides and it's in the book actually shows up in the ad. You go, okay, we're doing good. You're not quite done yet. You want to make sure that uh, you meet the grammar guidelines in the back of the uh, How We Tell Our Story guide. There it is. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that your ad has been approved by your supervisor. If you're the dean of the school, heck, you can probably just run it. But if you're like most of us and you're just a uh, worker bee, you know, it's probably best to make sure that somebody else uh, signs off on it before it magically shows up in the Sunday newspaper. And there is a key point there. You might go through that process with your boss or committee, and the ad might lose its magic. That happens, unfortunately. We all created awesome ads that eventually kind of get boiled down to the point that they're not so great anymore. And if that's the case, you kind of have to go back to square one and figure out, and, and talk to that person and have that honest conversation. We always say that we'd rather just tell people the truth um, if they want to hear it or not. Because sometimes if, if you aren't conveying what it was you started to convey, you've got to reevaluate it. Print ads are too expensive. You don't want to 
spend hundreds or thousands of dollars if you're not going to get your point across. And all these people are here to help. They help us. They help you. A lot of, a lot of very talented, good people that can assist you through this process. You're almost done. You got your ad approved. Everything's ready to go. These are the, the dot in the I's crossing the T stuff. This is where you're really lucky to have access to talent like Susan, who's done this. Um, the Daily Emerald, people who can help you make sure that all the little stuff is done. Have you ever noticed how the Registry Guard is this big when you open it, and the Oregonian is this big, and the Wall Street Journal is this big? A quarter page ad isn't the same everywhere, so you need to make sure it's exactly the right specs. And you need all these geeky things. You've got to make sure you give them the right file type, and how are you going to upload it to them, and CMYK, and all these terms and words. If you have a professional on your side, call it a team, no big deal to make sure, because if you mess that stuff up, your awesome ad may not print right, but there's lots of people that can do that stuff for you. There's an example from Oregon Quarterly, all the production details about how you actually take your great ad, and make sure it gets to Susan properly, and make sure that the printer puts, puts what you put to uh, good use. Uh, we suggest that after you have your awesome ad that you uh, put it on Facebook, email it to your friends, Twitter about it, um, that's your sphere of influence. If you're having a big sale, you can put it in the Emerald, that's awesome. But the people that you already have contact with are probably more likely to respond to the general public. Here's an example of the Facebook page for the Google Advertising uh, Marketing Brand Management Division. There's some of those ads showing up there. You should do the same, easy, free. It probably will be covered at your next seminar. Is that a little tease? And last, uh, collect the care sheet. Write down your notes about what, what you liked about it, what you didn't. We do that every year. It's amazing how you always forget a year later. We do work with Eugene Symphony every December on their Yuletide celebration. Every January we meet, we evaluate the event, we put it in the folder, all of our notes, even though we're never going to forget. And sure enough, come next October, I've forgotten absolutely everything, and thank goodness we write it down. Do the same with your app. Write what you like about it. Write the feedback that you got, or lack of feedback, because at some point in the future, it's going to take you five minutes to do it, and you're going to be really glad you have that information. That's the game plan we use for selling genes, for selling jets, for selling education to parents, students, professors. Um, it's a tried and trusted process that results in professional ads and effective communication. And uh, we couldn't do it without the handy hundred million page guys. Thank you very much. If not, please sign the email list if I don't have your email address. Grab yourself a rose gold pen, some chocolates, and be aware that April 6th, we're having the social media, which includes Twitter, blogging, Facebook, really a hands-on approach to your communication module. And uh, we'll be doing these seminars uh, four to five times a year. We really appreciate it. So thanks so much.